so the, the speaker is um, uh, Sam Kwon Lee, and he presents the paper Life Writing by Vice Text Editor for Asynchronous Playback of Life Coding and Writing. And he's a PhD candidate of uh, in Computer Science University of Michigan, United States. And his research advisor, Dr. George Essel. So um, he characterized himself on his website. You can find him. He said that um, computer music, human computer interaction, and live coding, and his skills in C, Java, HTML, JavaScript, Node.js, and a big and huge of technical skills. So I think we could expect a great uh, presentation. <laughs> Although I have to my reboot my computer uh, for presentation, uh, typical computer scientist problem. Um, so I guess I'll have to wait uh, until the computer reboots. Uh, but I'll <coughs> briefly, I will we'll start my presentation. So. So I'm talking about, uh, so I'm, first of all, I'm very pleased to be here in the first uh, live coding conference. Um, and uh, what I'll be talking about today is about, uh, it's uh, live writing, uh, and it's about asynchronous playback of live coding and writing. So probably title to you a lot of things already. And this is not a good uh, desktop, I guess. So I've been interested in uh, <coughs> doing some research in uh, collaboration and communication in the context of uh, live coding. So uh, I guess I'm coming from uh, collaborative live, collaborative music making background or, or network music. So um, what I like to do a lot here is to bring some of the tradition, uh, some of the tradition uh, in network music and apply it to the live coding context. Uh, this is not the program that I want to launch, by the way. Um, okay. Okay, that was for rehearse. Okay, so... <coughs> So yeah, last year in the live coding and collaboration symposium, I had a chance to talk about uh, models and opportunities in uh, network live coding. And this is coming from uh, network music or uh, in general collaborative mu music making. So I, 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 I'm going to keep bringing this chart over and over again today. So this is proposed by Verbosa. It's one of the way to classify <coughs> uh, collaborative music making or network music. Uh, you can. Um, there's two ways to classify uh, network music. Uh, one by whether people are co-located or remotely located, and whether the collaboration happened in synchronous way or in asynchronous fashion. So um, last year I said that like most of the existing network live coding scenario falls into this top, uh, no, bottom left corner where people are, are co-located and then um, they're networked, uh, uh, co they're co-located and they collaborate in real time. But um, uh, I'm trying to expand the usage in the live coding context. So 
Today I'm going to talk about this area, where is asynchronous collaboration in live coding, which seems weird because uh, the term asynchronous doesn't go well with uh, live coding. But um, I guess, uh, like it, well, if you if you think of uh, outside the performance, there's there's gotta be a lot of asynchronous collaboration <coughs> between live coders. Um, for example, you exchange email, you exchange ideas uh, over email. That could be a a typical way of uh, asynchronous collaboration. So how does how do live coders communicate and collaborate asynchronously? Uh, maybe they don't. They they wait until they get together and then rehearse, improvise together. But there are some ways to communicate and collaborate asynchronously. Like uh, a lot of time, people we use uh, some other materials such as uh, open form score. Uh, which is a fancy way of saying written explanation, or code itself, or screencast, uh, screen recording of play, uh, uh, playing uh, live coding, or uh, the recorded audio of the piece. And imagine over the course of rehearsal, uh, uh, well, they can rehearse when they're, uh, when they're together in the same room, but they can exchange ideas uh, using these kind of materials. So um, I guess in general, how do, how do musicians collaborate or communicate a, uh, asynchronously? Like one extreme example, how can you, how can, like in traditional sense, how can a musician play a piece that was composed uh, centuries ago? Uh, that's what uh, music notation do, does in a traditional sense. So uh, I try to think of uh, what the music notation is in live coding music, but I guess it's kind of difficult difficult problem for me to answer because uh, in live coding it's the, the composition is delayed until the moment of performance or you can say it's a free improvisation or you can say structured improvisation or real-time composition we can s talk about this whole day and uh, uh, but re instead of trying to answer the question I released the question into how to archive live coding performances or rehearsal so I try to come up with some ideas and look at what are the existing ones. And these are some of the existing ones in uh, traditional music that you can record an audio of the performance. Uh, of course, you can do the same thing for the live coding performance. And uh, uh, in, in the other end, in the symbolic end, uh, you can have a music notation of a live coding piece. While you have a code uh, for a live coding piece, um, in the middle, there's something weird. Like screencast is very popular thing in the live coding context because it's like screencasting is kind of similar to uh, pe watching people or musician playing their own instruments. So the screen itself, the code inside the screen is the instrument. So <coughs> I guess that's something that we can consider. But the code is not, I guess code is not exactly uh, equiv equivalent to, to music notation, I guess, because uh, I guess the, the, uh, imagine the final text th that you will have at the end of the performance. And a lot of the code that ha you have been using are not there anymore sometimes, or you modify parameters on the fly. Uh, and, and yeah, some of the code that uh, you use in the performance are, uh, you just deleted it for some reason. Uh, so I guess code, it doesn't tell you uh, the whole thing to reproduce the piece. Uh, and then it doesn't have the, uh, time information uh, that you uh, run over the uh, over the performance. So uh, I try to think of something else, and then I realized that in traditional music we have something called MIDI file. That's a kind of somewhere in between music notation and and uh, audio signal. It's a symbolic information. It has the uh, all the timestamps of the uh, uh, note that a uh, musician plays. Uh, and it's not exactly the thing special about that uh, specific performance. So maybe I thought I could come up with something equivalent to MIDI file in live coding context. So it's a very simple, stupid idea. Um, so I'll show you how it works in the Chrome. So, so this is the demo in Jibber. Um, I was testing the sound of this demo, but I, I'm not sure if I will get the uh, sound this time. So
So basically what it does is I just launch my web browser and then just code in jibber. And then uh, I don't think I'll get sound this time either. Did you check the volume? Yeah, imagine there's this awesome music coming from behind my silver uh, 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 battery. But it's uh, basically, I just code in the web browser and it will log all the keystrokes with the timestamp information. And then uh, after I finish my live coding and then I pre press the post button and it will post all the data to the server that I have in back in Michigan. And then uh, once I have this specific uh, link, Imagine that I have the link and then I send it to my friend and then and who I was going to collaborate with and he can exactly replay what I did at home in private. So this is a good way that I can uh, like I can let him listen to uh, my rehearsal in in private and then cool thing is it, uh, it's kind of different from screencast because it's uh, like all the simple symbolic information are still there. So you, after you uh, replay this, you can copy and paste this text, and then you can add more codes on top of each other, and then you can uh, you can do anything. Um, so at least I have some visual elements in it, so you can see something. Okay, that's uh, much better. Although there was no sound, um, and I can prove there is a sound because I'm mapping the scale of dots into uh, uh, volume of uh, drum sound. So that's pretty uh, straightforward. There's nothing. There's no rocket science. It's just I just do typing in a web browser. I just log all the timestamps and then replay it. It's a co very common techno uh, technique that are used in many different contexts, mostly in uh, writing research. Uh, so in writing research, they do experiment, they let a writer type uh, in, the, in a computer and then because uh, they wanna do an interview afterward, they, they just replay their writing and then uh, do some interview in retrospective way. So this is just a demo, but uh, I could just create a new document uh, and then start typing things and then post it and I'll get this link and then I send it to someone else and now he or she will be able to play what I did. So it's uh, like this is coming from uh, like existing idea of uh, asynchronous display of code in live coding. Uh, like these are some of the example. It's, uh, it was told in Monday Jibber has the uh, uh, Jibber website has a, a gallery where you can publish your code and then uh, later some people can browse the code. Uh, and uh, Thor's uh, Theranos code has the piano roll like uh, uh, interface where you can have a code snippet inside a small box and then let the time bar time bar uh, progress uh, from top to bottom so that it will play the uh, code that was written uh, prior to the performance. And I was uh, directly inspired by this uh, uh, David's performance last year using Daemon uh, Super Collider, which uh, automatically types code text in sync with uh, tempo. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that's uh, I guess that's pretty much of it. And then I, I just want to switch the su uh, subject quickly. So, like one of the one of the main principles in live coding is to show us your screen or the other way around. So I guess it's a very, uh, I mean, it's an important thing in live coding. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, it happens outside the live coding context a lot. You know, like today in, in uh, popular uh, culture or internet culture, they like to share their screens a lot for almost everything. So you see, we already see live coding.tv, like people share the screen of uh, programming some people like to uh, uh, game uh, run a live game streaming TV. Uh, sometimes they create a video tutorial with voiceover. Uh, it is not like a traditional tutorial where you 
uh, uh, record a lot of things and then edit in a filmmaker, but instead they just start the record button and then do whatever you do and then and just post it on a YouTube. Uh, so it's, uh, and then Google Doc, you can see someone writing in real time and then they can post their reaction to uh, watching music video. And I see these are kind of uh, improvisational nature is prominent in this uh, internet culture, I guess. So uh, yeah. I guess why not we do the same thing for writing? So I, I have been exploring this writing as a music performer. So, uh, so I have another project called, has the same title, Live Writing. So what I do, I just go up on a stage and then write a poem on a stage. And then uh, the sound of typing and the uh, content of the poem will be sonified and visualized. And then this is the visualization technique that we've developed uh, that works on the web browser. Uh, but like I'm just saying that I'm doing synchronous live writing as well. But like most of the writing is asynchronous collab uh, communication. So you write an email and you don't expect someone to read your email behind you, right? So it's a private thing, but like a reader will read your email, uh, not at the time that you're writing, but af afterwards. So like a lot of things, most of the written communication, email, blogging, Facebook, or any kind of social network, it contains uh, some elements of writing and then uh, maybe we could, since we have this thing, we can use it for writing as well. So I'll do the demo for the writing. It's the same website. So if I start demo, I just get a text area. So I am writing, uh, let me see, random. Maybe I'll just correct it to waste. <laughs> so and then I post it, and then I'll get the same thing. I copy to clipboard, and then imagine that I send this link to someone else, and he'll be able to copy and paste this link. And what happens here, the, the writing that I just did a moment ago will be replayed on the web browser. So. I guess it's, uh, I don't know, I, mean, I, don't, I don't mean you have to write any, everything in this way. Uh, it would be probably awful if I uh, present my paper writing in this way. <laughs> uh, it's pretty shitty in the beginning. So. Uh, so it's, uh, basically it changed the writing into a real-time experience. So. It feels, I mean, reader will feel private, I guess, uh, than, than uh, just reading static text. And then you see some of the things that were hidden in the static text. So uh, you see some of the corrective steps. Uh, so you see where I pose, you, you see where I burst. So a lot, a lot of the emotional state that may uh, a writer was in may uh, emerge during the, uh, this pro uh, replay process, so, such as I don't know, contemplation, hesitation, or changing your mind, or agitation, anything. So, uh, yeah, so what is this like? I, I feel like I'm, I'm misleading this thing because I'm using the term live writing. And then, uh, like this was the writing that was posted in the platform that I developed. Uh, it was because the, the live writing platform was not uh, released properly. I guess it's one of the reviewer uh, wrote uh, something about my uh, website, and then I I brought it I brought it because it has a valid point. So it says uh, it's similar to plain writing because uh, there is no sense of live audience in front of me. So I think it's a valid point. Uh, and I think one way to answer this question is to actually play this writing.
you see that change of thought so that happens in real time. So uh, I'm not sure if the reviewer is in this room or not. I'm sorry if I, uh, I'm presenting this without your permission. I couldn't get permission because it's anonymous. Um, but the fact that like uh, your writing will be presented in real time manner, uh, I think it will change the mindset of writer immediately. Like all the temporal dimension is the new uh, like new uh, expressivity for writers, so you can add uh, intention. You can add something intentionally to uh, to express yourself in writing. So uh, you can intentionally like write f words and get rid of it afterwards, or you can just emphasize your some of the sentence by typing in certain ways. Uh, that could happen. So I'm just, I'm just it's, and then it's kind of like uh, close to. Uh, improvisation, I think, is uh, is now the writer arrange text in a way that it will uh, present it to reader in efficient way, uh, in an artistic way or efficient way, in any way, so that it's clo I think it's close to uh, an activity where a composer organizes sound in in time. So uh, implementation is just a web editor. It can extend any kinds of text area and code mirror API. I hope it will be able to be useful for uh, web-based data such as atom.io, bracket.io. I'm not saying this is bound to web, app, but it could be extended to uh, any kinds of editors such as Emacs or anything if it's allowed. Uh, uh, It's f it's gonna be useful just uh, beyond just archiving. So I hope the, uh, the the data it logs in the website will be useful for analyze the style of writing or live coding for the researcher. Uh, and eventually I'll be I'll add these kind of navigation bar. You can where you can navigate the writing or live coding uh, in timeline. So you can pause at some po uh, moment or fast forward or uh, do this uh, opposite thing. At the end of the day, you will have this kind of uh, GitHub thing. So uh, this is, I think of this as a real-time source logic control system that works in keystroke level. So uh, nice thing is you play someone's uh, live coding performance, and you can, uh, on top of that, you can uh, add your own code so you can basically collaborate with uh, uh, any live coder that posted this uh, in the website. So basically what I did is to follow this principle, show us your screen, uh, in any time. So thank you. That's all. Media Interaction Group, the Information Technology Research Institute. And uh, his PhD in computer science received in March 2014. So. Okay. So, yeah, thank you for the interaction. Um, today I'm going to talk about this system. And um, my respect to the program committee who uploaded the paper online. I'd like to do the presentation based on the paper, but 
you know, it's, it's too long. It, I don't have so much time, so I just make it shorter. Um, so it's based on my paper. So uh, if you want to know the details, just read the paper online. And so as you know, many songs and the derivative content are uploaded online. Um, but all, all those uh, websites for you know, watching videos and listening to music are mainly designed to just distribute content and not for authoring content. And in, in, in this meaning, um, programmers live in a far more advanced world since you know, we have Git GitHub, we have live programming environment, we have ba web-based integrated development environments. Right? So I really thought it's important to design a uh, content authoring environment that supports both uh, you know, content authoring, I mean data manipulation, and live programming. So uh, in particular, this paper introduces uh, one example of such integration of uh, content authoring environment and live programming environment, which allows the user to create kinetic typography videos. Um, and um, so kinetic typography um, is a technique to animate text as you saw in the previous in the previous talk but um, it's, it's the same thing basically well sorry it's a Japanese so you might not be able to um, you know see which one is which but uh, you see the correspondence between the character and the thing that is displayed on on this environment right so um, this is kinetic typography and while many live coding environments focus on impro improvisation of music, my system focuses on providing a platform on which the user can elaborate on creating videos, which is kind of finished product. Um, so it's not an improvisation, but instead, we, uh, the system I provide is to create this uh, complete set of, um, complete set of the video. And, um, but you know, I envy people who do live coding since it's really cool, right? During the presentation. So th that is why I'm presenting in this way, like a performative way. Um, so uh, yeah, actually this is my second iteration of the devel development of the system. I originally developed the system for desktop computer, but now it's uh, online. That means you can just access the website using your web browser and then boom, you can create this kind of videos. And the principles behind the system is that videos is uh, pure functions of time. Uh, usually when you create a video using uh, you know, Windows Movie Maker, Adobe Premiere, that, that sort of thing, you publish the final video as a MP4 or you know, the sort of usually um, you know, rendered as a set of images um, that is aligned in, but um, Actually, we can think of the videos as a pure function of time, which means that, so, you know, in this case, when you provide time, uh, the system renders each frame. So we can write a function that uh, receives the time as its argument and output <coughs> this image, each frame. In this way, actually, we can create a video with um, infinite uh, resolution in time and you know display. So currently, it is so this uh, this video is rendered on this display. But actually, since this is controlled by a program, you can project it in onto an you know, infinite resolution of the display, like you know, so many uh, displays, uh, so so large display. And yeah, so how can we make this kind of videos? Um, so when you access the website, this is a talk page. Uh, you, can, you can search for a song, for example, I input the keyword and it shows the results from uh, search from online. So this is an example of an online video. And then, um, since the system is for uh, animating text of songs, uh, which is um, li lyrics of the text, uh, lyrics of the song, you need to uh, input the lyrics. So it's 
Actually, um, in, in my case, uh, in this case, I've already input the lyrics, but um, I just register the URL, URL of the lyrics here. And then we can just wait for several minutes. And then we can just click this create a new video button. Then actually the system analyzes the correspondence between the text in the lyrics and uh, the song. So um, you can immediately start playing the kinetic type of video. So as you can see, um, we've already implemented a preliminary function for um, analyzing English uh, lyrics, but it's not deployed on the uh, online server. But uh, please wait for a week to uh, make this online. And so this is the video automatically composed from a set of um, this you know, original audio and the lyric text. But we can, of course, edit it by clicking this edit button. So it shows this you know, long, long list of um, lyrics. So you can seek to any, any arbitrary time to see you know, what was being vocalized at this point. And um, so if I want to edit uh, here, I can just select these you know, phrases. And then I can change the font. I can change the font size. Everything is interactive. Uh, you can change the font weight. Uh, and you can also change the style of the text, uh, the, uh, the animation. So this is too simple, so I, I might want to change it to a bit more like, yeah, this way. And then um, <coughs> the good thing is that you can not only choose the style, but also um, you know, uh, tweak the parameters for these styles. So everything is in, done in live. And now you might think, what is the relationship between this content authoring environment and live coding environment? So um, the fact is that everything is rendered, rendered as an as a, as a output from the pure function of time. Uh, we can change the implementation of this animation by clicking the edit button. So it shows the source code for this animation here. Um, you can see that there is a JavaScript source code. And actually, the interface that was, <laughs> um, let me change it to a different tab. Yeah, so um, you saw the slider here um, on the bottom. And these sliders are generated from the comment in the source code. And also, yeah, let, let me change the style of the animation. A very simple example that um, I'd like to add. Uh, so, for example, scaling factor. Like, you know, it's, it's a little bit too, too large. So uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And I click this update button, which actually you know, changes the visual of the video. And I think I can just play the video. Yep. I, I don't want this. this one. So um, I can change the implementation. Like, so I now change the scaling from 0 0.5 to 1, which enlarge the text. And I can also uh, change it to uh, like, I'm creating a variable here that says scaling equals um, one, sorry, 50. And then I put this as a member variable. And I also add a statement that uh, as a slider. 
at at UI slider uh, zero one hundred. When oh, I need to. Yeah, so basically I added a variable that changes the scaling of this animation. And, and then you see this, this slider, which actually um, is working right now. So in this way, um, the programmer can uh, change the source code of this video and update uh, this GUI, which can be later used by the user. Um, or the designer who cannot um, write code. So um, that's the main feature of this text alive online. And um, the thing is that all source code is uh, version controlled. You can see uh, the source code on, on this website uh, if you access it. And there are all version controls. So you can uh, navigate to the older version or fork a new version. Uh, so that you can create a derivative content of the original video. And and then, um, so of course, some template can make use of uh, another template, which means um, some animation can uh, use, use part of the uh, original animation and then um, use it um, as part of its own, own animation. So yeah, pretty much that is uh, the, the whole you know, view, overview of the system. <laughs> and um, so as a conclusion, um, we created uh, this uh, TextLive online as a web service. And at this moment, uh, you can, we can only um, create this video on this website, but it might be interesting to allow external developers uh, by providing an API to um, you know, just use the motion algorithms developed on this environment and use those animation um, algorithms for animating text on their own websites. And actually it's already uh, done in some sense because you've already sold this, right? Um, it's embedded on this website. Um, so I'm going to expose this kind of API that allows um, you to uh, create <coughs> this kind of animation on your website. And of course, our future work includes improvisation of kinetic typography videos that, that actually <laughs> has much overlap with the previous uh, presentation. But um, I think it's really interesting to enable a text jockey style to create a text animation on the fly similar to a disc jockey and vi visual jockey and live quarters. Um, so yeah, pretty much, pretty much that is um, all the presentation. Um, so yeah, it's, it's developed by myself, but also with a collaboration with other uh, researchers and engineers in my group. Um, and actually, uh, the thing I've shown you is um, the latest one, and is not upload deployed to the um, the server yet. But I'm going to deploy it uh, later, because I, I wanted you to be the first audience of this system. <laughs> okay, so yeah, thank you so much. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see. Well, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, thank you so much. Everybody knows that it's <laughs> 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 <laughs>
but I have some, some text. I found the official information and also not official on the site. So, uh -oh. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Zero, <laughs> like no? Yeah. I have some from artists like Colin and the performer, director, cybernetic orchestra, associate professor in the Department of Communication, Studies and Multimedia, Mark from Master University. Eldad is with us here this morning, and I mean this morning, because what time is it for you, Eldad? It's uh, around 6 o'clock. Oh, good. He was here for the workshop on Monday morning, too. It started at 4 o'clock in Montreal. Um, so Eldad's a trooper. I'm going to hide you, Eldad, but... Um, thank you, Alan. So this uh, is a presentation about extramurals. Um, I seem to have a sensitive video table here. Maybe I'll stand over here. It's a presentation about extramurals. Um, at conferences like these, you often hear about systems that are the result of the substantial work and thoughtful work of people uh, over many years. Um, this is not one of those systems. Um, it, this is officially uh, a dirty hack. And I suppose I'm getting what I deserve <laughs> <laughs> for that, this video game. Well, let's try. There we go. Um, so the big picture of it, um, it's an environment for collaborative live coding over networks. Um, I've learned in the process of hacking at it um, that Node.js is duct tape for network music. Um, it also uses a library for Node.js called Share.js, which is a free and open source software library that seems to have been released into the wild um, by an ex-Google uh, engineer. Uh, and allowed collaborative editing in that Google Docs style. And the reason why this dirty hack came about was really that uh, a small group of us were booked to do a network music performance using Tidal, Alex's language Tidal, and tried various ways of getting it going, and nothing kind of worked in Emacs or what, what have you. And at the last minute, um, we took a couple of hours, and I mean a couple of hours, and threw this thing um, together with, with duct tape, as it were. And so then after the fact, as one does, we rationalized it and came up with actual goals <laughs> and focuses for the system. And, and I would characterize as those as supporting globally distributed ensembles um, and perhaps m more distinctively as having a language neutrality. Um, so we're using you know, languages that are just collections of text characters. Um, and so we can support different kinds of languages at the same time. Um, how it works really quickly. Um, these parts in the middle are the parts that we have made, uh, uh, two, two programs, a server and a client, some number of clients. The um, server talks on the one hand to standard web browsers over a variety of connections. It also talks over another variety of connections to clients that are running on you know, everyone in the group's um, computer. Uh, and then all of the text that gets evaluated in the server gets piped to what I'm calling the lang language, you know, instances of super collider or title um, or, or what have you. This is what it looks like. This is a screenshot of our performance at PixelFest um, in Norway last year. It's not pretty. Um, and if you have a problem with that, <laughs> it's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think there's something, so, uh, okay, but two, two more things we'll say about that. I think that it's, it's visual austerity um, can sometimes have something going for it when the focus is on the music, let's say that. Um, and also, you can make it prettier. And we'll get to that at the end of um, this presentation today. 
So done a series of performances, and I think Alexander, you want to you know, say something about that, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was invited to to join the, this uh, collaboration last year, and I the first time I participated with uh, Extramuros was in the in, a, in Norway. I was the only one in location in, in Bergen, and it it, it was uh, very clear to the audience what was happening. We were using a chat a window for chatting, and people were understood perfectly our comments, what the music was about, and they knew I was not the only one making the music, though my computer was the only one performing the sound of, of all of us um, making the, the code together. Uh, that time we used, all of us used Tidal. I also had a, 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 a with the short lived band called Color TV with Ash Sega. Last year we also had a performance with both of us. He was in, in Birmingham and I was in Berlin, and we used Super Collider, so talking about the language neutrality that, that also allows for this. And yeah, we, 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 the band has also had other performances. That, um, this was in the, the Network Music Festival, no? The one in Berlin with Ash, no? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So it, it is, yeah, the interface is very, um, very clear for the, for the audience what's happening to see our edits in live time, in real time, yeah. It's also very useful when we're chatting and they're like, okay guys, it's time to finish the piece, so the audience knows that we're going to finish and that it's very, yeah. okay. That's Great. And, and maybe you can see from the slide that it's our, it's our obvious goal to perform at every festival or conference <laughs> uh, in the world. And only having to have one person on the ground, of course, lowers the cost of that, <laughs> which is always important. So I think, you know, so we, the, the main, the, the, uh, the in retrospect main goal of the project to support distributed performance is one thing, um, but we discovered that it was useful for other things as well. Um, for example, projected ensembles. This is a picture of the cybernetic orchestra, the laptop orchestra I directed with Master or a subset of it anyway, um, performing. And you can use software like this to take that laptop orchestra performance, project it, as we did at the Network Music Festival, to another site where the performers are not present uh, at all. And you still get a sense, I think, of it being a group performance um, because of the visual interface. Um, screen sharing and co-located ensembles, I think um, <coughs> my route into live coding, or at least in a direct sense my route into live coding was through the laptop orchestra, um, the laptop orchestra movement or the laptop orchestra phenomenon. And I, I think in retrospect that one of the real challenges of that way of making music when it's done, let's say without live coding, is that the performers are not very aware of what the other performers in the ensemble are doing because they're focused on this kind of space right in front of them, whether it's with a gestural controller or whether it's with you know some kind of interface on, on, on the screen. And by having a single web-mediated interface for making sound, we're all seeing the same things. And so in the cybernetic orchestra rehearsals, after we started using this interface, there was a change in the character um, of the rehearsals. And I would say a change, at least in, in my own sense, of how we were co-present to each other uh, in these rehearsals um, by virtue of seeing each other's screens. And finally, it's really useful for zero configuration workshops. And we did that uh, here at the Extramuros workshop on Monday. Because what you can do is you can come in as a workshop leader, you can run Tidal or Super Collider on <coughs> one machine that is yours, that you have total control over, that you've already configured, and then allow the client and server extra Neuroff system to give access to that machine to all the people in the workshop. And it means you can get going, you can get making sound, you can get exploring things in the first couple of minutes instead of after an absolutely deadly 20 or 30 minute um, delay. Um, so that's really useful. I meant to play this video while we were talking here, and I'll leave it. Um, is, is a video of the first Algoscape, which we did in Hamilton um, this February, the invitation of the city of Hamilton. Um, you can't hear it, can you? <laughs> And so we have eight performers from the Cybernetic Orchestra. They're spread out along the side of a large outdoor skating rink. Uh, 
it's nighttime. We have Ethernet cables connecting all the laptops. Audio cables connecting all the speakers. We're performing beat oriented music. People are skating. Um, you won't necessarily see it so clearly in this video, but at either end of this long fence, there are two video display windows. And what's visible there is, again, the extra Muros interface. And I think, uh, in addition to being uh, just a blast, as you can imagine from the name Algoscape, that it would be, um, I think the thing that was really gratifying for me, and I got some photos of it, is we had these two video screens at the end of the ring, and people were watching the code. People would skate around, and then they would stop for a few minutes, and they'd point and decipher. And you could see, you could actively see their process of engaging with it, trying to decipher the code, um, which was really um, rewarding. Who's that guy? This is a screenshot from the workshop on Monday. Uh, I like setting um, new world records. And when you control the terrain, that is particularly easy. So um, this is the largest, hitherto, the largest um, collaborative extramuros jam with the 20 or so people that were at the workshop uh, on Monday. Um, but if you can start getting your computers ready right now, I think we can probably break that record uh, again. I'm serious. <laughs> so we're going to talk briefly about future work. Yeah? Right. So as David said so elegantly earlier that the interface isn't, there isn't much going on. So recently uh, we've implemented uh, Java, like allowed for JavaScript to work within it uh, and the communication of OSC messages so that we can visualize events that's going, that are going on in the music. Um, and then to get to um, like some feedback and particularly visualizing the program states, something that we're working towards. Uh, and then hoping, hopefully ending up where we can uh, you know, interact with the computational events in multiple views, you know, so, so along the projectional editing uh, area. You know. So in here you can see just a you know, screenshot of you know, kind of a quick visualization that we kind of pulled in. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So it's getting prettier, in other words. <laughs> and because it's JavaScript, you can make, it, that's not pretty to you, you can make something that is pretty. Um, second axis of present and future work, synchronization issues, um, time issues, which is something that's come up through the conference, uh, of many types. Uh, but there's two that I'm sort of acutely aware of um, from having my hands in contact with the material. And uh, one is that very small timing differences can lead to drastically different results when you're dealing with combined audio signals. I'm talking about phasing, basically. That would be the most traditional way of putting it. And I've got a super collider example of, of it here. Let's imagine that we do this in extramuros, and someone makes this node A that makes this low frequency sine oscillator. And that now exists on all of those machines that are distributed around the world. It's happening at slightly different times, but it's got the same shape. It's got the same identity. Now, a moment later, someone does B. And it also has the same shape all over the world at slightly different times. And now someone comes along and thinks they're clever and makes a combination <laughs> of B and A. And all of a sudden, because of these two different frequencies of these low frequency oscillators, C looks completely different at all of the different sites uh, around the world. Not necessarily a bad thing, but definitely something that raises complex issues, right, about what the identity of the performance is. Um, when is that difference too far, right? I guess is the way it's going to occur to people um, making art in this context. Second set, what should happen to deliberately stochastic processes when they're distributed or not a network? You know, if someone generates a random number in the way we're using the system right now, I, I hate using the word system, in the way we are using this dirty hack right now, if someone makes a random number, you know, you're going to get a different random number uh, in all of those different locations. Maybe less of a liability if you're doing things like what you saw in that visualization a second ago where things are kind of being spread with a high density all over the place, but when maybe when the density of events gets lower, um, those differences are gonna be more dramatic. Um, so I don't have any answers to these questions, um, but uh, I do think that the, the way that things can go to come up with better understandings around these questions may involve 
a change in the way that programming languages and environments work in the direction of languages and environments that accept the diffuseness of networking, what I'm going to call the diffuseness of networking, these time and identity discrepancies that come in, that accept and incorporate and, and sort of work with those things in a more fundamental way. Whereas what we have right now, and I think this is analogous to observations that have been made in the live coding literature about programming languages that don't deal with time in a very good way. I think we also have languages that don't deal with networking in a very good way. Our languages represent the other nodes that you can communicate with as a, as an, as a total outside, right? You, you send a message, like a message in a bottle, out to the outside and you may or may not get something back. Um, but I can kind of imagine languages that might work differently in that respect. But I'm wary of, um, always wary of utopian or rather dystopian um, fantasies of universality and control. So I really hope that there will not be sort of one way of solving these issues, but, but many, many different ways uh, of solving these issues in many, many different languages. Or as Captain Universe says, you can't stop the signal. People will always find ways of avoiding those utopias. So here's our state mandated audience <laughs> participation moment. Okay, um, get out your laptops or your phones would work also. Um, in fact, someone at the Algo Skate, some, one of our members could put their skates on and their phone and they went out and they skated and they live coded and skated at the same time. Oh, sorry. Trying to set a world record here, so trying to beat Monday's record. Is that an O or a the, zero? Uh, all the all the things that look like O's are zeros. Okay. That seemed a lot smarter when I first did it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave the instructions up for a moment before switching it over here as well. People are getting the website? <laughs> Anyone? <coughs> people are getting it? And would you say the ICLC <laughs> password? Oh, oh, yeah, people are there. So it's hooked up to title right now. I'm going to take those instructions away. There you all are. Yeah, okay, so here I go. You ready? In five seconds, I'm going to read out the URL. I'll just spell it out. Someone's going already. There we go. www.d0kt0r0 dot net colon that's important eight thousand slash index sixty dot html what's the password and the password is ICLC got it. got it yeah you can edit without the password but you can't evaluate code without the password Uh, maybe not on the clock, but we, but we actually have done a, a dual title super collider performance with this. But the, the hacky way to do it is just to have two copies of Extramuros and connect one to super collider and one to title. Is that the password to what is called? ICLC. ICLC. 
And so people who know Tidal, um, your, your Tidal instructions always start, or often start with a layer that you direct it to, like D1, D2, D3, D4. Um, with Extramuros, you get bonus layers. Um, there's 60 of them. So D1 through 60. Change the size of these, any of these windows. Just pull on the bottom right corner if you need more visibility. Someone deleted my code. We definitely got more than Monday there, so I'm going to take a screenshot so we can prove it to the authorities at Guinness. I'm going to take the liberty of uh, cutting you folks off. I made the mistake of doing something like this, not with a programming language, but with questions in a 300-person uh, freshman class at, at a university once. And, well, you can imagine how hard that was to uh, bring back under control. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I, I should mention, for those of you who read the paper, LDAD is here with us too, so if you have any questions about the workshops we did with this at Concordia that are described in the paper, LDAD can take those too. Uh, and maybe if, if, uh, um, if we can't do it now, you can do it on Slack as well. Okay. So, I don't know how from organizers Fifty, which should be a performance once and for all. So, thank you. Sure. Thank you.